прощения. I have not done the homework. I picked it up from a book. Um, exercise. No, um, but just, just make sure that the approach is right. Um, yeah, yeah, that'll be there. Yeah, probably this event. If you have problem, uh, has anybody else tried this? I guess you tried it. Same thing. I get a zero. Okay. Right, right. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's uh, that's it. So. If you get a zero, if the question then is what does it mean? It's sort of a difficult thing. Hmm? Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, that, that's the interpretation that you have to offer then. Like if C equals to zero, that means that there is no control. You know, basically cutting that loop open. So the process itself is critically damped when there is no control. Well, it's possible for a second order system to have their time constant in such a way that it is critically damped. But, I mean, it's possible in the sense it would be highly coincident that all your time constants, there are two time constants in the second order process, right? so they are in such a way that it, it is critically damped. It's more likely that it is either over damped or under damped because critically damped condition is a very specific condition, right? So maybe they made up the numbers in such a way that you get into that and that makes you think about what is what is the meaning of critically damped. But I really didn't solve it. I should have done it. But it was the first assignment I was like because I've been overloaded with a lot of other things as you can see that I haven't been able to turn your quiz yet. I will try to get it by Friday. Um, <laughs> I will look at that. Uh, okay, any other questions? Uh, I learned the meaning of concentrated study period. We have never had it before. <laughs> so apparently I'm not supposed to give you any Work that had some weight, exams or even assignments. Uh, I was going to give you one more assignment, but um, what I will do is I will give you a problem set for you to look at before the exam on the material that you have not had a practice. Okay. And uh, I won't ask you to submit it or evaluate it because I looked at the exam and there's really not much time um, between. Uh, it's uh, Tuesday, right? I just checked. Uh, uh, Tuesday between 12:30 and 2:30, uh, 11. Okay. So uh, we won't have a week time to get it back to you, etc. I will do that. Right. I will do that. Okay. I'll put, put the answer, and uh, then I will encourage you to come and talk to me. Problem. I'm not planning to put any practice problem test because I'm not <laughs> not to do that. Okay. Um, I'm supposed to hand this in, and I need a volunteer to. Yeah, I guess you know what this is, right? This is the course evaluation form. So maybe today I will try to wrap up 10 minutes before the class if I forget to remind me. So that you have about 10 minutes or so to fill that. And then who would be. So thank you. So uh, collect all this and then give it to Danny.
Um, I did look at the usage of uh, model to see whether, because it was a new technique, and I wanted to see whether it was useful or not, uh, particularly the recording and the posting the lectures ahead of time. I find that it was used quite well. Moodle had some statistics that you can generate, random statistics. So, of course, the most visited one was kind of bad. <laughs> <laughs> for the whole class, for the class in small, <laughs> I can tell you on the average how many times each of you have visited that. Um, but even the recorded lectures, I think, got I mean, a good number of visits, like 31 times on 15 people. That's not bad. So I don't know whether you find it useful or not, but if you can make comments on aspects of this new technology that you find, useful or how we can improve it. If you find some of them are not very useful, how we can improve it in the future. Uh, <laughs> I don't even need, uh, well, I do, if it would be nice if I have a wireless microphone so that I can, whenever I walk there, I notice that the mic doesn't pick up. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah, I've, I've noticed. I've noticed. I, I am monitoring this to see what are the problems so that I can fix them in future years. <laughs> but yeah, I agree. This is not a great mic. <laughs> um, so I should get a wireless um, mic where I can walk. The other problem I, I've noticed is. Uh, if I tend to use the board, I'm talking about it, but there is no corresponding visual cue on the capture screen. So writing helps, because whatever I write is captured. But it gets really terribly messy after that. Um, if, I, yeah, if I'm not writing, like if I go there and point out, then when you're listening to it again, you don't get that. So, I should try to use the pen as much as possible, even though it gets closer. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The other thing that I should play with, I guess, on some of the idea is not writing some of them on the notes that I put in, but develop it in the class. Maybe that will help in following the steps because I'm mostly talking, not writing much. And uh, that mode of interaction would be helpful if all of you are participating in questions. Some lectures, I myself will be very pleased at the end of the lecture. This went well because we had good interaction. Some of them, like last one, I think. <laughs> no. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, uh, we will, um, I will have to work on some of uh, these techniques, I think, to keep you engaged. Um, but any comments that you have, I think, uh, would be helpful uh, in uh, kind of making this uh, better uh, for future. And the other thing I wanted to point out in the Moodle page is that I put up the final, I just checked the date and the time and the place, I suppose, will be the same classroom. So the final exam is on uh, May 11th. Close book, uh, same format as the midterm exam. Okay. And if you need anything in the formula sheet, uh, make the recommendation. And I will update the formula sheet uh, maybe by middle of next week so that you get a version. You can look at what is going to be in the final. And if you still want to give some suggestions, I will take them. Okay. Um, Process control, like any course that we have done so far, okay, um, it's, it's a huge topic. So we have to draw a line somewhere when the term comes to an end, and we would not have covered everything that one could have covered. But the basic important thing from my point of view, I think, is you feel that you have learned something, whatever that we have covered, you have a good grasp of it, and you have the confidence to learn on your own. Um, how, you may, how many of you are planning to go to graduate study? <laughs> <laughs> Only one. <laughs> have you had a, have you picked a place? 
So you will well, hopefully take a graduate level course where uh, it will build on there. Um, but what are your learned in MATLAB? I'm sure most of you will, when you go to work, will find MATLAB as an environment that is used to the process control section of the job. Uh, so uh, we, will have, we are going to draw the line arbitrarily uh, for your exam, I would say, at the root locus. Because uh, it still gives us uh, some time for you to study. There is one more topic that I will introduce, and that is the frequency response method. Uh, I will introduce the idea, talk about the concepts, maybe do one or two examples, but I won't examine you on that. And then one can go on to state space methods and more advanced control methods. Uh, but I think we have covered as much as what uh, was covered in the previous lecture. That's the topic. We might cover the frequency response method. Now, um, root locus, we started looking at the basic idea behind the root locus method. The basic idea is the method plots on a graph, an xy graph, the locus or the curve of the roots as you change the control parameters. So we are talking about tuning the control uh, parameter kc. And as kc changes, the roots of the characteristic equation change their location. And it is possible that for some value of Kc, they may move to the right hand side of the uh, y axis, which is a danger point because it becomes the feedback system becomes unstable. Okay. So root locus from the point is a very powerful method. Uh, it's a graphical method. And in the last class we saw one example where we had a simple proportional controller. Now we want to see how that method changes, or the, how the approach changes, really doesn't change much. Just the algebra becomes a bit more complicated. Then I have a proportional integral, and then the proportional integral derivative control. So in the process, you will come across more terminology. We talked about four. Now we're going to introduce something called zero. But the basic idea is the same. So whether you have a number of fours or a number of zeros, you're tracking the roots of the characteristic equation. So in this case, I have GC, the controller, as a proportional and integral controller. So there are two parameters. Okay. Um, so the first thing that I do is I formulate my open loop transfer function, which is the product of all the transfer functions in, in the loop. Okay. And then 1 plus G equal to 0 is my characteristic equation. The roots of that characteristic equation change as I change KC, as I change tau I also. But in the root locus method, what we do is we freeze these parameters. Tau i, for example, will be just fixed at one value because there is only one graph as we change kc. So if you change tau i to a different value, we produce a different graph. So it actually has to be a three-dimensional graph, if you like, with uh, tau i having a second axis. But that's not normally done. We just produce a series of uh, x, y graphs for different values of tau i. Okay? So the first thing that you will notice here is this is written as uh, Kc times tau is plus 1 divided by tau is. Okay? And that tau is goes to the denominator, the tau is to the denominator. And the tau is in the numerator is written as simply Kc times tau is plus 1. Okay? The next step that we do is we write them in the form of fours and zeros. Okay? The denominator that simply means I'm going to write this as this particular term, for example, as s minus p1, where I define p1 as minus 1 over tau i. Okay? And that I, we saw in the last class already. We call those as poles. Okay? So this is a third order system. There are three poles. These poles are simply related to the time constant, minus 1 over tau 1, minus 1 over tau 2, etc. But the integral action introduces a, an additional pole. Where is that pole located? At zero. Okay, because it is at minus zero. You can think of it like that. So the integral action always introduces a pole at the origin. Okay? And integral action also introduces a zero. So the numerator, that one, is simply defined as minus one over tau i, the integral constant. Okay? So and that is called a zero. So a transfer function, an open loop transfer function, can have a number of poles and zeros. And we will 
also include a derivative action soon, and you will see that the derivative action introduces two zeros in the numerator. Okay. So that's that's all the main difference there. We are introducing a few more terminologies, zeros and poles, but all these are numbers that are known. Is that one is related to one over tau i? I should be tau i. Okay. P one, P two, P three are related to tau one, tau two, tau three, and k is a constant that is related to the tuning constant k c, and it also has tau one, tau two, tau three in it. But that is a unique relationship. So if you know k, you know k c. Now, typically in MATLAB, what you will find is uh, there is a function called R locus, which analyzes. All you need to do is give a G, define what G is, the open loop transfer function, and it formulates the closed loop transfer function once the G is a characteristic equation, solves all the loops, and generates a nice graph for you. Okay? And when it does that, it does it in such a way that it uses only K. So when you are solving practical problems, it is your job to find out what is the relationship between KC, the proportional controller gain, and K, that is the effective gain for the entire open loop transfer function. Okay? The effective gain meaning the effective multiplying factor. Okay? Any questions? Uh, So the integral action contributes one zero, that is in the numerator, and it contributes one pole at the origin, which is due to this term. And the characteristic equation is one plus g equal to zero. And when k is equal to zero, when you have a question? This whole term is g. And we, the characteristic equation is 1 plus g. So g is what we call the open loop transfer function. Yeah. One over. Yeah. The integral action is 1 plus 1. So this is the integral action. One here is the integral action. Okay, zero is um, this term. What appears in the numerator, we call that as a zero. Okay, zero by definition is the values of f at which the open loop transfer function becomes infinite. So the poles are these. When s equal to p1 or p2 or p3, the denominator becomes zero, so g becomes infinite. Those are called poles. Zeros are those values of s for which that function g becomes zero. Okay? So when s is equal to z1, that function becomes zero. Okay? So z1 is called a zero of that function. And G is the open loop transfer function. And remember, the open loop, the concept of open loop is if I have a set of feedback and let's call this G1, G2, and H, we are opening up this loop, the feedback loop. So, and then you look at what you input, a set point change, and what comes out here without feeding back. And that is determined by the product of all the transfer functions in this loop, g1, g2, and h. Okay? And that is what is involved in this particular case. Okay? So g is the product of all the transfer functions in the entire loop. But 1 plus g is the one that accounts for the feedback. Without it, g is called the open loop transfer function. 1 plus g is a characteristic equation. Now, you need to understand these and remember these meanings because when you're interpreting a problem, you'll be given this is the open loop transfer function, what is the characteristic equation? You should know. Okay, the uh, relationship. Yeah. And, yeah, remember, when s equals to zero, that means that there is a mapping between s and t, tan domain and f. 
So that, that simply means that that particular instant of time, there is no response because you're making g equal to zero. That doesn't mean that there's no control action. So that's it's a continuous variable, and as s changes from zero to infinity, t changes from zero to infinity. Okay. So th these are just the locations where the behavior is uh, what you would call singular, meaning either it's zero or infinity. So they get special names, like zeros and poles, but there's really no no other meaning. Uh, Special meaning that you can attach to them. Physical meaning. And all these terminologies evolved in electrical engineering first. Process control basically evolved from what electrical engineers were doing with their system. Okay, so uh, th that is the characteristic equation that you see here, 1 plus g. And you do the factor one more time, take the denominator out, multiply it by 1, and this is your characteristic equation. The root locus method solves for the roots of this equation at a function of k, the parameter that appears here. Now, for a proportional integral action, is that the only parameter that is in the controller? No. There is another parameter that is in z1. So that's frozen. That is the tau i. The tau i is fixed as a constant, and you change k continuously and watch for that value of k which takes the roots to the right hand side. Okay? Now when k equal to zero what happens? Then the roots of the characteristic equation are the same as the poles. Okay? So you'll find these poles appearing in the root locus method, starting with k equal to zero. And then you change k to infinity all the way. So you scan the entire range of k is zero to infinity, and see starting at these four locations, where do they go? Okay. Okay. So for a specific example, let's say tau one equals one, tau two equals half, tau three equals one third, tau i is equal to one fourth. The integral action is one fourth. And so we can figure out the relationship between k and kc, which is given as kc divided by tau 1, tau 2, tau 3. And so we know all the poles. z1 is minus 4, which is z1 is nothing but minus 1 over tau i. Tau i is given. Okay? And p1, p2, p3 are the poles. That should appear in the root locus diagram. Okay? So g then, by substituting these numbers, you get a numerical numerically substituted open loop cancel function with one parameter in there, k, which is going to be scanned for an entire value. In MATLAB, what it does is all you need to do is define define this part of the transfer function. Take out the gain separately. I'll show you, uh, let's start MATLAB actually. I'll show you what, mat, how MATLAB implements this particular Open loop transfer function. As I said, you need to define open loop transfer function to MATLAB. It uh, solves for all the roots and plots it for you. So the phrase where you can make a mistake would be in relating k to the way that MATLAB interprets it. So I'm going to kind of ask for help on MATLAB and see whether you can interpret the meaning. So let's just ask for help on your code. <laughs> R locus is a function that does the root locus plot for you. And here is the help. Okay. Can you read? Right today, I guess. Um, so it says that the take as input sys. Sys is a transfer function. That is an open loop transfer function. Okay. Uh, single output, single output. Okay, and uh, it analyzes a negative feedback loop. So it analyzes a loop like this. Okay, so what are they saying about the k? Yeah, from the, can you interpret this diagram and say what we are looking at and what is the relationship between that and what MATLAB is doing? Shows the trajectories of the 
closed loop pools. Closed loop pools. Th those are the roots of the feedback system. As k varies from zero to infinity. What would you suppose I give you this problem that we are looking at? What would you need to input to MATLAB, and uh, what would you expect? How would you interpret the graph that it produces? That's the practical question that we are addressing now. We know how to construct the open loop transfer function. We know what the poles are, what the zeros are, and here we have actually a number in, for all the poles and zeros. And here we have a transfer function which I've kind of expanded. To represent in terms of the polynomial form, both numerator and denominator. Once I have the polynomial form, I can define the transfer function to MATLAB, and I have in fact the code. Okay. The numerator, for example, it is 1 and 4. Where do they come from? It comes from first coefficient, second coefficient, the first degree polynomial. In the denominator, it is 1, 6, 11, 6, 0. Well, I have 1, 6, 11, 6. If I stop there, it will interpret it as a cubic polynomial. To indicate that it is a, a quartic polynomial, I need to also put 0 there. Okay? Because the number of entries determines the order of the polynomial. So these are the numerator and denominator. Then they call the transfer function ef function as a numerator and denominator. And it will give me this one as a transfer function. Okay? That I can pass to odd locus here. Important point now is what have I done with the transfer function that I've developed and how does it relate to how MATLAB is interpreted? MATLAB is telling me that it is solving actually this kind of a block where SIS is the transfer function that you define and K goes in there. Kind of a feedback part of the loop. Is it the same? Remember, under open loop condition, what, is, what does it mean? It simply means that we need to open up this part of the loop. Open up this part of the loop. I put in a signal. What I am getting out? That's what I'm defining. Okay. And so I have basically, when I define in um, the MATLAB workspace, I'm defining only this part, s plus 4 divided by s to the power 4 plus 6x cubed plus 11 squared plus 6. That is the only part I have defined in these two. I have left out k. Okay. So k MATLAB will put a value of 0 all the way to infinity. Okay. So it is exactly the same. And if you are given a problem, what we need to do is assemble a numerator and a denominator, factor out this constant k. That k is related to kc. That you need to keep track of independently. Because what MATLAB will tell you is the gain that goes in that block, okay, k. But that k is related to kc through an equation like this, which depends on tau 1, tau 2, tau 3. That you need to figure out and keep track of. Because what MATLAB is going to give you is only k. Is that clear? That's the only part where I think you can make a mistake in interpreting what you're doing and how you need to communicate that to MATLAB and what MATLAB gives you back you need to interpret. Okay, so let's do this now uh, in MATLAB. And there are other parameters that you can give to R locus. It can, for example, take optionally as a second parameter a value of k. What would that mean? That simply means do the root locus, but don't generate the plus, evaluate the value for that particular value of k. The k that appears in there as a gain in this loop. Okay? And um, you can also optionally specify don't plot, but give me the results, numerical results. So when you put on the left hand side r comma k equal to r locus, it says I'm not going to plot, I'm just going to give you the numerical numbers. We'll uh, find uh, use for those. These are the same ideas that we have used in the past. Okay. So let me define the numerator as 1 and 4, the denominator as 1, 6, 11, 6, 
zero. And then uh, first uh, structural function. Sorry, thank you. Okay, so this is the transfer function without the k. If you compare it with this part, you'll find s plus 4 divided by h to the power 4, etc. That should all be echoed back there. Okay, so that is the transfer function without the k value. Okay, and then I say r locus. That's where the real power of matter is. It's a lot of magic and produces a graph for it. And you need to be able to interpret that. Okay. So there is a interpret diagram. Okay. <laughs> These root local diagram can look very, very strange. The next one I'm going to do factual caution here about some of the empirical rules that industry uses so, uh, as K changes. So why does the loop occur? That's the nature of the problem. There is really no, you cannot a priori predict when a loop will occur or when a loop will not occur. What you need to know is what do these results mean? What do these curves mean? Okay. So the four stars that you see are the poles when k equal to zero. That's when everything starts. Okay. So each graph will start at one of those start points. Then as k changes, it gives you the path of the roots. So each one is color coded here, but unfortunately, I don't know if it's different because it's colored. I can see it very well. I think this is getting to be an old projector, I think. Not doing the color mapping right. Okay, so for example, starting here, thank you. That's better. <laughs> okay. So starting here, for example, the red one, the red, so this is all one curve as you continuously change k. So k will be zero here, and then k will be going to a large value. And if you click on it, it actually gives you the value of k. Okay, the gain is zero, and uh, the pole is at minus two, and it gives you the damping overshoot for a second order equal and second order system. Okay, and if you click somewhere there, gain is 384. So that entire rip curve is as you change k. But remember, it's a fourth order system. There are four such roots. So as you change k, all the four roots will evolve. And it shows you uh, a good overview of all the poles. Okay, the other pole starts at minus three, and that I think is the green curve, not green. Okay, and it goes around, loops back, and it ends at this zero. Gain is infinity there, and the pole is at uh, minus four, and so the k value is going from zero to infinity on that entire path that you see here, as I'm showing you around. Okay, that's the second route. Okay, the third route starts, for example, at the, remember, for an integral action, there is always a pole at the origin, you say. There it is. Okay, and the gain is zero, and as you click on this, the blue curve, the gain will change. different values. But what is important to us is that value of the gain for which the rail part becomes positive. So for example, this is a, if you pick a gain of 636 k and then find corresponding kc and put that onto your controller, the controller will blow up because there is a positive value. You see 3.59. The rail part is positive. The imaginary part of course is there that this is oscillation so this is going to explode in an oscillatory way. Okay? And if you kick far away, all those numbers go away and then you can start the search again. So I really am interested only in this point. So approximately at a gain of four, K value of four, okay, I have uh, instability. Now I did not exactly click on it because with the mouse it's very difficult to do, but you can see that the real part of the pole is 0 0.015. Okay, so if you need to find, and we are going to do this later on, if you need to find that value of k where it is exactly zero, you need to go through a search process, bracketing process. I have a code for that and I will show you how that is done. Yeah.
This is an, uh, I have another problem coming in that will anticipate that question and that will explain that. What is most important for you is to locate that value of k where it becomes unstable. Remember, these are four different rules. For any given value of k, you will have four rules. Okay? That's an important concept to understand. Because it's a fourth order system, if I pick a value of the gain, there are four rules. Not all four rules can be positive or need not be positive. Okay? So if I pick a value of k equal to 51.6, okay? I always know right away from this that there are at least two rules that are positive. But there is a 51.6 somewhere on the red line. That would be a negative. That doesn't mean the system is stable. Okay? And there is a 51.6 on the other green one, dark green one. Okay? So just because this entire red curve lives on the left hand space, it doesn't mean that the system is stable. But to be unstable, all you need is one root to be on the right hand side. At any value of KC, you have four roots, but only one root has to be positive for it to be unstable. Yeah, sorry. I, I'm not following. Can you repeat that again? Oh, if the right side of the graph wasn't there, or the curves never went to the right hand side. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. If none of the curves traverse to the right hand side, if they all live on the left hand side alone, as you change k from zero to infinity, that is an absolutely stable system. You can pick any value of k and all the four rows will live only in the left half plane. That would be a stable system. That is the result ideally that we would like. But for most feedback control systems, some of the rows will have kicked to the right hand side. And the question is, how can we control, how can we manipulate? For example, one question, this graph is for a particular value of tau i. The next question that I can ask is, if I change tau i, what happens to this graph? Do I get to have a larger value of Kc and still remain stable? Or does the value of Kc become smaller for where the stability boundary is? Okay. Those are the real practical questions that you need to uh, ask. Uh, once you learn how to use the tool, you, as a control engineer, you can uh, ask uh, and explore those kinds of questions. Yeah. This gain that you see here is K. So that is related to KC, the actual controller gain. This is a net gain for the entire uh, block, product of all the transfer functions. Okay, and that is the meaning of the health note that I showed you here. When when it shows a graph like this, they have taken the net gain and put it on a separate block. And this is the one that you've defined and passed to the MATLAB on analysis. So the K is related to KC, but we have seen how exactly it is related. Okay? Do you have any question? Any more questions? I think I'm probably going to stop here. It's 11.20. I'll give you 10 minutes to fill this. And we'll continue with this problem and the next problem uh, next lecture. This is something that I want you to be able to grasp and uh, be able to do in an exam. Okay? So I'll take a few more extra time uh, in order to go through this uh, slowly. All right. So.